Few world powers have been quite so fond of insane mega projects as Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party. Through the 1930s, Nazi Germany embarked on engineering projects on a massive scale, drawing up plans for thousands of weird and wonderful machinations, from the total redesign and development of the capital Berlin into some kind of totalitarian super monument, to the ridiculous P-1000 monster land tank. But at sea, Nazi Germany had a vested interest in combating the might of British shipbuilding, both merchant and navy. But despite being in power for 12 years, Nazi Germany never built an ocean liner to answer Britain's Queen Mary or France's Normandy. Why, when ocean liners were such a key symbol of national power on the world stage, did Hitler fail to introduce a Nazi ocean liner? Believe it or not, there were actually two fully-fledged plans for a superliner to carry the mantle for Nazi Germany, but they were just never completed, and here is why. When Hitler and his fascist party assumed power over Germany in 1933, they assumed control of a nation with advanced engineering capabilities and technological innovation. This was most evident at sea. Germany's ocean liners were some of the best in the world. Norddeutsche Lloyd, or North German Lloyd's Bremen and Europa, had directly threatened Britain's dominance on the transatlantic trade and really introduced a new era of transatlantic liner. They'd been introduced in 1929 and 1930, a product of Weimar Germany some three or four years before the Nazis rose to power. The two sister ships were Germany's premier offering at sea. They were over 900 feet long, displaced about 55,000 tons, and were very fast. The two ships each won the coveted Blue Ribbon, the award for the fastest passenger ship crossing across the Atlantic. And they were pretty forward thinking too. Both ships carried a catapult and a Heinkel HE-12 mail plane to be launched when close to the US so that mail could get a head start before the ship docked. But while Bremen and Europa were absolutely dominating the transatlantic trade, there were other, smaller German liners operating on less popular routes around the world. Norddeutsche Lloyd's competition Hamburg America Line had invested in three huge superliner sisters before the First World War, Imperator, Vaterland and Bismarck. But these had been confiscated at the end of the war and sold off to British and American shipping lines instead. Hamburg America Line didn't then try to build a world-class superliner at all after that. Instead, they focused on building smaller, more economic ships, carrying both cargo and passengers to South America. They did build some dedicated ocean liners though, like the SS St. Louis here, a modest 16,000 ton transatlantic workhorse. She was pretty and functional, but a fairly far cry from the gargantuan splendor of the Imperata and her sister ships. It was probably the Hamburg South America line that was building the most impressive German liners of the 1920s, aside from North German Lloyds, Bremen and Europa, of course. The Cap Arcona was a great example of these. Completed in 1927, the ship was a real beauty, and at 27,000 tons, she wasn't exactly tiny either. So that's a bit of a rough assessment of the state of German merchant shipping at around about the time Adolf Hitler came to power in 1933. By then, Bremen and Europa had been unseated from their place as the fastest ocean liners in the world by the Normandy and soon the Queen Mary. Germany would have to answer the British and European challenge, and if there's one thing Hitler and his lackeys loved most of all, it was showing off. Ocean liners were grand and always in the spotlight, and Nazi Germany needed a response to Queen Mary and Normandy. The Nazi government invited Germany's shipping companies to submit design proposals for superliners to catapult German shipbuilding back into the world stage, and Norddeutsche Lloyd and Hamburg America Line's designers set to work on creating a true superliner for Nazi Germany. First off the mark was Norddeutsche Lloyd. In 1937, Norddeutsche Lloyd representatives took a train to Berlin to present their design to the Reich Ministry. They'd worked with the shipbuilder A.G. Weser and Bremen before on the SS Bremen, and the design that they showed off that day in 1937 was very much in the tradition of that slightly older ship. The design called for a liner at 1,075 feet long and in excess of 80,000 tons. This would make the new ship the largest liner in the world, but she would also be the fastest. The ship's long hull and clean lines would be the perfect form for carving through the water at great speed. And to power it, the ship would receive an enormous power plant, turbines driving no fewer than five propellers at 300,000 horsepower. This immense power output would propel the new liner through the ocean at an average of 35 knots, meaning the blue ribbon prize would fall to Nazi Germany. The fuel costs would have been enormous, but the government intended to subsidize the liner's operations. Crucially though, the new liner's decks would be even more uncluttered and cleaner 
than those of Normandy and Queen Mary. To enhance their profile and balance them out, many ocean liners from the era used dummy funnels, smokestacks not connected to the boilers or engine rooms constructed purely for cosmetic purposes. But Norddeutsche Lloyd would have none of that. The new liner would feature only one enormous funnel towards the front of the ship, which gave it a strange, imposing appearance. If completed, the monstrous ocean liner would surely have achieved the brief, deposing the Queen Mary and reigning as the largest and fastest ship at sea for the foreseeable future. In a curious twist for a narcissistic regime such as the Nazi party, the new liner would actually be named America, maybe in a move to court American public opinion and sway them towards more friendly relations with Germany in the case of a war with Europe. In any case, the design was largely approved and work continued on refining the details, but by the time of the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, no kill plates had yet been laid and the America existed only on paper. But by 1941, things had changed a bit. Hitler's armies were at their most victorious, having crushed Europe's armies and implementing a sweeping invasion of the Soviet Union, which, until then, had been going exactly as planned, resulting in local success after success. Relationships with the United States had soured though, and in December 1941, the US sided with the Allies after being attacked at Pearl Harbor. Norddeutsche Lloyd's superliner project would now need a new name, so Victoria, or Victory, was chosen as a suitably bold and self-congratulatory moniker. Victoria, though, was doomed to stay on paper. The ship was never built because, by the time Norddeutsche Lloyd was at the final stages of preparation, Hitler's armies began to suffer at the hands of the Allied powers, and by 1945 it was all over. Hitler's dream of a great totalitarian state was dead, he was dead, and the ocean liner Victoria was dead. Norddeutsche Lloyd lost basically all of its ships, and its days as a major transatlantic player were done. Victoria's drawings were archived away, and the plan was all but forgotten about. But while NDL had been spending the latter part of the 1930s just kind of sitting on their hands and not building the Victoria, it was their competition at Hamburg America Line who actually managed to get a Nazi ocean liner off the paper and into reality. Hamburg America Line, also known as Haypag, had spent the 20s and 30s building modest, smaller ships and had stayed mostly out of the race for transatlantic dominance. But by the mid-1930s, it became clear that if the company was to compete with its international rivals, they'd have to do better than just offer passage on some small cargo passenger ships. Their new plan called for a trio of liners, whose construction would be subsidised by the Nazi regime. Haypag decided not to follow in Norddeutsche Lloyd's footsteps. The trio of ships would not compete with Normandy or Queen Mary for supremacy in either size or speed, but they would be some of the largest German ships afloat. The first ship was planned through 1936 and 1937, and the final design was curious to say the least. It would be 824 feet in length, and about 41,000 gross registered tons, which was considerably smaller than the Queen Mary and more in the size category of transatlantic liners that had been built and launched about 20 years earlier in the days of the Titanic. She'd be a little bit slow too, with a turboelectric setup driving two propellers to give the ship a top speed of about 24 knots, or 11 whole knots slower than the proposed speed of Norddeutsche Lloyd's Victoria. The design team clearly took great inspiration from the French liner Normandy with this one. The bow curvature and breakwater at the front are almost identical to those found on the French liner, and I've even seen some people credit Vladimir Yorkovich, Normandy's chief architect, with Vartalan's design. The addition of two squat funnels made the ship look a little bit stout. She'd have had capacity for 354 first class, 435 tourists and 533 third-class passengers. In 1938, the keel was laid at Blomenvoss in Hamburg, alongside the likes of the German battleship Bismarck. Haypag chose to recycle a favourite old name. In the wake of the First World War, the SS Vaterland, or Fatherland, had been taken off the company's hands and sold to United States lines. That had been a huge blow to morale for the German people, so Haypag hoped this new Vaterland would carry the torch. Except it never would. But by 1940, war was raging, but Germany was doing quite well, so work continued on Vaterland's hull until the ship was ready for launch. She rumbled down the slipway at Hamburg before being led into the fitting out wharf, but then disaster struck. Germany's military fortunes were reversed and work on Vaterland was diverted to more pressing matters. For years, the ship's incomplete hulk sat with work halted or continuing at all but a crawl, but then in July 1943, Vartalan's day of destiny had arrived. 
Operation Gomorrah was a combined Royal Air Force and US Army Air Force initiative to destroy the city of Hamburg, and for eight days and seven nights, the city was bombed mercilessly by Avro Lancasters and B-17s. The effect was tremendous, and the raid left about 35,000 people dead and 61% of the city's housing destroyed. When the smoke cleared, it became clear that Blom and Voss had received horrible damage, and the Vaterland itself had taken two direct bomb hits. One of these detonated within the ship with such force that the ship's forecastle deck at the bow blew out and peeled up over the bridge. The ship was now just a write-off as far as Haypag were concerned because things just got worse from there. As their armies suffered more defeats and the war decisively turned against Nazi Germany, no attempt to salvage or repair Vaterland was ever made. In 1945, the war was over and cleanup could begin, but Vaterland sat forlorn and abandoned for another three years until 1948, when the Hulk was broken up for scrap. We do love a good what if on this channel, so it's pretty tantalizing to think of what might have happened if Vaterland or Victoria were completed before the end of the Second World War. How do you think they might have compared against the Queen Mary or the Normandy? Let me know in the comments below. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. You can support my work by joining me on Patreon or subscribing to a channel membership, and you'll find a link to that in the description below. As always, and until next time, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you then.